anything that you can do in terms of keeping the body perfect or healthy also comes back in the spirit. And so when you want to talk about spiritual pursuits, whether it's being spiritual, being integrated with others, being part of, you know, a, a happy community, the more you can do or the more you can be open and happy about that, And it's almost impossible to be happy in a miserable body. My name is Mark Squibb, and this is the Lifestylist Podcast. Okay, Lifestylist, I've got one hell of a show for you. It's episode 390, Oxygen Training for Immunity, Brain Health, Anti-Aging, and High-Performance Fitness with Mark Squibb. Your show notes for this episode can be found at lukestory.com slash mark. Our guest today is an incredible dude named Mark Squibb, a serial inventor. His outfit Live02 evolved from a family health journey to a profound health technology. The Live02 platform has become a cornerstone for health that increases fluid intelligence, rolls back age, and optimizes quality of life. Most users shed 10 to 20 years of lifestyle age within months. This stuff is insanely cool. Here's a partial topic breakdown so you know what you're getting into. Mark's tear-jerking story of family illness that led him to developing Live02, the epiphany that helped him resolve his son's severe seizures, the profound results Mark has seen using simultaneous maximums of blood flow and oxygen, how a concussion syndrome that has persisted for five years can be healed in just five days, how we can extend the average functional life expectancy of high-performing athletes and veterans, the rarely talked about foundational step that is crucial for any kind of spiritual growth, improving erectile dysfunction with Live O2, one for the fellas there, well, maybe the ladies too, how oxygen training can greatly reduce anxiety symptoms, reverse inflammation, and even improve your marriage, probably related to the aforementioned point, and the importance of opting into this new system of health autonomy instead of spending energy destroying the old one. Mark's guiding philosophy of empowering himself and those around him to heal themselves. How Mark combined a B vitamin and O2 training to find physical youth again in his 60s, proving that age is just a number. Mark also shares his invaluable knowledge of implementing various ancient home remedies to stay out of the hospital. And finally, Mark's number one tip for raising resilient children. Hint, it does not involve going to the doctor. Okay, I'm not going to bore you with any more talking points. Just trust me when I say that this is one conversation you don't want to miss. Truly fascinating stuff. And if by the end of this epic info download with Mark, you want to check out his technology, Live02, visit lukestory.com slash live02. That's the letter O, not a zero. Before we begin, Mark would like to dedicate this episode to the memory of John Bastian, Mark's business partner and mentor. Enjoy the show, and please share it with a friend. All right. Mark, good to hang with you, man. I'm so excited to continue our conversation. Yeah, I knew when we connected uh, downstairs, I was like, this guy's got a lot to offer uh, beyond, you know, the world of physical fitness and technology. We started having a chat, and I thought, man, we got to record. This is amazing. So I'm stoked. So let's start out with, I guess, just describe what oxygen training is for us. Well, the short version is it's exercise on steroids, if there is such a thing. So like oxygen training, if you've exercised, the main purpose of exercise is to get get your body moving, moving blood, moving oxygen to the tissues. And the concept is that Oxygen in the air doesn't do much until you move it and then it reaches where it needs to go. And so if you think about your brain or any other part of your body, if it's not getting oxygen, it can't make energy. And if it can't make energy, it can't do what it's supposed to. So as we age, um, stress events and stuff basically interfere or create obstructions to that delivery. So we end up with this perceived 1% loss of vitality as we go through life. But it turns out that a lot of that loss is unnecessary and for the most part about 15 years reversible for everybody out there. Wow. So like, for example, most of our users, um, and you can do this, this is quantifiable, measure their functional ability to produce energy and that over a period of 
maybe a couple of months. Uh, their ability to reproduce or produce energy will increase by minus 15 years. Damn, that's 15 crazy. 15 to 25. That's crazy. And so it's like we, we installed at a um, retirement home. <laughs> All right. And if you can ever visualize putting the Fountain of Youth on a trailer and driving into an old folks home. I mean, it was like, it was like cocoon. <laughs> I remember that movie. Okay. And we yeah. literally in the, in the, in the gym where we had the system set up, there was the corner that had the retired prosthetics, the retired wheelchairs and everything. It was amazing. And like, the problem was that we, even though this place bought like a bunch, they still had to turn away 50 to a hundred people a week. And this is a small community. So anyway, my point would be, it wasn't what got through thrown away. It was the fact that everybody just felt so much better, so much more vitality that it was the best for them because it was like, you know, they were reconnecting spiritually, they were playing pickleball and it was just amazing. And so to be part of that was um, one of the most rewarding things that I've ever been just because, I mean, everybody became young and they started enjoying life and it was beautiful. So back to the oxygen training. I never thought when I invented the system that it could be so simple for people to just get get young, start having fun, and get back in the spirit of life. And so the mechanics are really simple. Well, not so much, but the point is you exercise, you get your heart rate up, you increase the amount of oxygen in the body, and then when that happens, the body will move the oxygen throughout and any part of the body that's not working because it hasn't been getting enough the oxygen, it will fire up and start working again. The big thing is like from a medical oxygen point of view, they'll give oxygen, but they don't do anything to cause that oxygen to move from the lungs to the tissue. And so the special thing about our version of oxygen training is that we challenged the body, and one of my key inventions was called adaptive contrast, which is opposed to just giving somebody oxygen and make them work, we actually give them a second reduction in oxygen, which effectively tricks the body into becoming as efficient as it can in moving blood, and then we throw a switch, and then they get a blast of oxygen. One of the best ways to describe this would be with our uh, brain protocol. And that's basically you put them on and you challenge them to the point where their heart's beating really hard to the point where they can hear it in their head. Okay, so with that brain oxygenation process, you bring to the point of that, and that's roughly four times more blood volume squirting to and through the brain. Once you establish that, then you throw the switch, and because of the heartbeat and rapid pulmonary response, they'll get six times at least more oxygen dissolved in the plasma, the water part of the blood going in. So for a brief time, you can get four times more blood with six times more oxygen that creates a blast of oxygen to and through the brain of 24 or more times normal. Oh my God, that's crazy, dude. So what's fun is if you give them an IQ test, the average person <laughs> will score between five and 15% smarter. Before. Really? Yeah. And it's, it, they don't always get it the first time, but with that, their brain well oxygenated, they're better, their brain works, they emotionally more stable, less anxious, they sleep better, and if they've got some sort of older brain injury or something like that, you're creating the conditions under which that can heal. What was your first iteration of this technology? It, well, actually, before that, maybe... For those that are visually oriented, describe what I saw downstairs. So I'm seeing, you know, like, I don't know if it's a Carol bike or, you know, one of these kind of exercise bikes. And then there's what looks like a giant six foot tall bag, essentially. And right. then there's an oxygen concentrator and then a mask. You know, that's kind of what it looks like, but maybe break down the components of it. And then I want to hear kind of the origin story of how you pieced it together because it's, it's very unique. Okay, well, the concept is simple, which is if you exercise, all we're doing is controlling what you breathe while you work out. Okay. Okay, so if you visualize yourself, you know, like working out at a mountaintop. Okay, so the minute, you know, 
basic altitude we work at is about 10,000 feet. Okay, well, so the concept is high altitude to activate the vascular system or activate the respiratory process and then switching to a oxygen rich mixture which would be three to four atmospheres worth of oxygen so that you're moving from one to the other so when you get into physical implementation you basically need two oxygen sources and a switch to move from one to the other got it okay so when you're looking at the reservoir it's a low pressure reservoir uh, you can hang it on a wall or ceiling but one compartment contains oxygen rich and the other compartment contains oxygen reduced air. Okay. And then there's a switch that you throw that lets you move from one compartment to the other that establishes the process and contrast. So when we engineer a protocol, we will basically, like in the example of the brain, we'll engineer the protocol so that the body will send extra oxygen or flow to the brain and then we'll hit it with oxygen by throwing the switch. So you know, the mecha mechanism is simple, but what we're technically doing is amplifying the natural physiology of exercise. So it's kind of like a version of high intensity interval training. There's a lot of chemistry and science behind that, but it's simple. And okay, you work out really hard. When you do that or you exercise, exert, your body will number one, create lactic acid and activate your respiratory process. You do a brief burst. Then when you get to the end of that burst, you're doing nothing but breathing and that high level of respiratory process. So what the product does is uses the low oxygen mixture to enable people to achieve that high intensity interval training activation level without having to do that work. So like, for example, oh, interesting. most of your audience, if you told them, when would ask them, when was the last time you went out and ran a hard sprint and did high intensity interval training? Probably 97% of them would say, well, that was 20, 30 years ago. Would you go do that now? They'd say, are you nuts? <laughs> well, okay, so when, you know, one way to talk about the phys the product is that it enables, like, somebody really old, like an old game show host, The Price is Right, to be able to do that at the age of 96, so when you do the training, because I've only done it once, I think they had one at Upgrade Labs in Santa Monica, and I was just kind of trying all the things out, and I got on the bike, and I, and I did it, and I, you know, I remember it was difficult, and I was quite winded, but I didn't really have an isolated experience where I walked in and just did that and learned about it. They kind of just ran me through the circuit. Is it necessary to, if say you're using a bike, is it necessary to like work out really hard while you're doing the training, or is it no. kind of the oxygen increase and then the deprivation is kind of what you're saying is simulating that same effect of if you went into a gym and did a 20 minute hit session and you're getting super winded then you rest for a second get your oxygen back breathe slowly then you're going to get winded again and i guess hypoxic would be the word for low oxygen yeah is it kind of mimicking that without having to actually go that nuts in a workout is that why elderly yeah. people and stuff are able to do it yeah so like when you talk about the physiology okay everybody associates you know training with very aggressive kind of gung-ho kind of training and the magic is like if you talk about our older users or you know geriatric or whatever you don't have to go hard you can like technically you, you can do any sort of exercise that increases your heart rate like if you got a base heart rate of 72 Anything that'll bring your heart rate up to 80 will produce physiological results. Okay. Okay. And so it doesn't have to. So a lot of our users start out just easy, 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 and it'll take them two months or something like that. But they get stronger so much faster that when they walk by, you know, they like, they walk by the mirror and they look at themselves like, oh gosh, I'm sick. Life sucks. All right. A month later, they're looking like, yeah, I got some kick ass. And they walk by again, like, yeah, okay, I'm going to go train. And so they progress. As they get stronger, they start to feel younger and more aggressive. And they will just start turning it up. And so what happens is they move to our simplest instructions, which are train on the oxygen till you get bored, throw the switch, train on the minus or the low oxygen till your ass is kicked, and then flip back. And at the end of the day, it's simple, but 
that those are relative notions, perceptions. Doesn't matter how hard that is. It's just relative to the person. So if they move back and forth in that cycle, they're challenging their physiology to their capacity or comfort, depending on their character or what they're trying to accomplish and just moving in that range. And that's why we call it adaptive contrast. So whatever they're capable of is enough to enable them to continue to move and just exercising. It's kind of like a rusty hinge. In the beginning, the hinge moves a little bit, but as you move it, the physiology adjusts and they become stronger and more able to adapt. And, you know, they start thinking about and behaving and perceiving themselves as athletes, even if they've been on the couch for 30 years. Got it. So it's, so the training isn't apples to apples. So if you take a high performance, you know, pro athlete, that's 25 years old at the top of their game their baseline for this type of training is going to be obviously much different than an older person, but they're they're each going to subjectively get the same net benefit according to their physiology and their current state no, the of capacity. Health. Okay. Got it. Uh, it sounds kind of like, and, and I know that it's more than this, but it's almost like you're going to 10,000 feet in a low oxygen environment, exercising, and then being dropped down to sea level and doing the other half of it and kind of going back and forth. It's almost like um, an altitude training, but at at will on on command is it is it kind of similar to to that effect right so um the high side we almost describe in simulated altitude terms so like we're coming out to help with some recent events or recent physiology issues um our base system trains somebody at about ten thousand feet which is not very much because if you've ever ridden on an airplane that's the cabin pressure got it okay so that's generally safe and easy for people. But as we've gone into, I'll call it more severe kind of respiratory and other challenges that are presenting, Mm -hmm. we ended up turning it up. So as we, you know, released our new product, especially around the anti-aging objectives that many people have, you know, you can move from 10,000 to 12,000 to 16,000 to 20,000 and so forth. Oh, wow. Okay, wow. and what we're finding in our anti-aging audiences is they're in this higher point. It takes them six months or so to kind of acclimatize, but they're literally becoming beasts. Uh, we have one user that helped us this time, and he's 56, and he's back at his college weight, back at his college performance. Oh, my God. Lifting more weight than he could in college. What? Yeah. Oh man, that's crazy. And he's like, man, this is great. Okay, we, we just did three hard days. Guess how many people I had to pay to come in and work the, the show? How many? Zero. Wow. Everybody that uses a product loves it so much that they were like, I want to be there to help share this. I mean, I, and I'm, I guess that's crazy. Was like, I'm just like, how in the world did that I get to- That takes like customer retention to another level, you know? It's like customer <laughs> recruitment. That's, that's pretty cool. That's enthusiasm. Well, I just, I, I, I mean, I couldn't I, just, just, I, I felt like so much love because yeah. having people that you, you know, you help come back and want to help and just be part of helping share the word. It just make, you know, it melted my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Those of you that were lucky enough to hear our past guest, Dr. John Laurence on episodes 367 and 380, will have some understanding of the next level of medical care called regenerative medicine. I personally firmly believe this is the future of medicine and true healing-based healthcare. So for those of you listening who want the best in cutting-edge orthopedic medicine, pain relief, injury recovery, spine and back issues, and stroke recovery, Dr. John Laurence has created the ultimate regenerative medicine clinic in Sarasota, Florida. It's called Advanced Rejuvenation. This is a one-stop shop for ultra-performance athletes, executives, and high-performance people who can't afford to waste time and money on outdated modalities of allopathic medicine. Dr. John and his team are truly the best as early adopters of stem cell treatments, prolotherapy, PRP, peptides, TRT sound wave therapy, and precision ultrasound-guided injections. They also offer what to me is the most exciting treatment to come along in years, methylene blue IVs with red light laser enhancement. This stuff is insane. Their unique combination of scientifically proven methods of treatments compound and create a potent entourage effect that is truly best in class. I've personally experienced their expertise and am completely blown away with the results. 
So if you're ready to solve the issues you've been unable to overcome and take your healing and performance to new heights, get in touch with Advanced Rejuvenation and explore your treatment options. You can find them at advancedrejuvenation.us. That's advancedrejuvenation.us. So I guess what you're describing in oxygen training seems to be much more dynamic than oxygen therapy. You know, I, I talk about uh, hyperbaric chambers a lot. I have one at home. I love it. It's, it's helped me tremendously with a number of things, especially brain function. Um, but that, as you said, is, is passive, right? And so you're not doing anything to challenge yourself because you're in close quarters and you can't, you can't change the cabin or not the cabin pressure because it's not a plane, but you can't change the pressure in a chamber quickly, right? You can't really go from negative oxygen to high oxygen environment like that. It's takes a really long time. And I think in order to go low oxygen, you'd have to hold your breath and you don't want to do that when you're depressurizing a chamber. So you're kind of just, you get what you get. And I think there's benefits to it, but it sounds like the difference between a therapy and this is pretty dramatic then. Well, yeah. So if you take a therapy, you know, as a notion, you know, the therapy is a passive, generally passive activity where somebody will... Um... <laughs> Hold that thought. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get your true kava soda. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Cheers. We just, for those watching on, on uh, the video we, and and those listening to the audio, we just had a little uh, true kava soda delivery. They're not even on the market yet. So I texted them. I'm like, you got any more of these things? Because I'm obsessed with them. So <laughs> shout out to, uh, to True Kava and their sparkling kava drink, one of our unofficial <laughs> sponsors. Anyway, carry on. Okay, so uh, what was I talking about? I was talking about the hyperbaric chambers. Oh, yes, therapy, therapy versus, versus training. training. Yeah. Okay, so when you use the word therapy, you're usually looking at you know a process that's administered or managed by a provider, and the person receiving doesn't do anything. Okay, so that's like okay, kind of like taking your car to the shop is an analogy to a therapy. Okay, training is something you do to and for yourself. You know, the self-actualization, you know, uh, I'll call it a delivered result or created result versus an earned result. And so when you look at the training or any training methodology, you know, the person who's doing it is in control. They're driving, they're pursuing some objective, whether it's superior fitness or whatever. And and it's it's really about personal self-administration and control of the process. But I think even more importantly, the pursuit of a goal And more or less the absence of somebody that's controlling the process for them. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Something comes to mind, you know, speaking of uh, oxygen, saturation, and then deprivation, and that is uh, various um, disciplines of breath work. You know, someone like Wim Hof or these different Mm -hmm. kind of breath work modalities where you kind of hyperventilate in various ways and then you might hold the exhale and you can hold that exhale for a really long time and then do twice as many push-ups on the exhale as you ever could if you were just sitting here breathing normally and I never I've never understood how that works but it sounds like you're kind of working with the same you know the same mechanism of action of that tons of oxygen to low oxygen and switching back and forth it's it's really bizarre what that does that there's kind of like a ancient yogic understanding well, yeah, of this somehow uh, belly or what is it tai chi belly breathing i mean right. that, like for example it's uh, fabulous you talk like so for example if you do wim hof with this these techniques yeah all right you know how, like when you do wim hof how long does it take you to get to the buzz phase probably 15 minutes really yeah he just held up a two for those listening. for two <laughs> minutes which is you know the point would be by using the rich oxygen and the reduced oxygen so like my favorite is i'll take it to you know the extreme altitude so i'll do wim hof at a simulated altitude of at my house i live at 7500 feet so roughly thirty thousand feet worth of simulated altitude and then you know when i do the oxygen breath holes and the pressurization i'm doing them with 85 percent. so if you take a look at the notion of contrast yeah the hypoxia etc and so when you're at those levels it's like you're there pretty quick Wow, that's so cool. Uh, the other day, <laughs> it's embarrassing, but it's it's also funny. Um, usually if I'm going to do some deep breath work, I'll lie down, you know, in case I pass out or something. The other day I was doing it and I didn't feel like I was I was going that hard, but 
<clears throat> I was doing my breath work and then I breathe in and I do a hold and I, you know, I clench all the energy centers. I put all the energy up in my brain, kind of a la Joe Dispenza or different yoga technicians. And so I got a good one in. And next thing you know, I'm on the floor, <laughs> on the wood <laughs> floor. Out. And I'm like, where, where am I? What <laughs> happened? And I, I, somehow I managed, I banged up both my knees, one elbow and like three spots on my face. I walk out into the kitchen and, and my wife is like, what happened? Did you get in a fight? I was like beat to hell. Thank God I didn't hit the corner of a table or something. Uh, you know, it was, don't try this at home kids, but yeah, it was a, it was a lesson in how, you know, kind of high you can actually get just working with oxygen. Well, that was just regular air, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I just, I was getting a little, I cowboyed it a little bit and I paid the price. Uh, luckily nothing bad happened, but yeah, it's, it's amazing what we can do just using our own physiology. And it sounds like with the assistance of some well thought out uh, technology like yours, that's, you know, really taking all of the physics and, and physiology and biochemistry into account that, you know, you can really do some incredible stuff. Well, just to take that one step further. So if you talk about the Wim Hof, you know, the strategy, okay, just for anybody that doesn't have our product still, if you try that, when you have a cold or a flu, you can power through the respiratory barrier in the lungs. So number one, if you, like Wim Hof, you don't even really get sick because you maintain that that uh, respiratory process and the sympathetic or the, the, the balance. Mm -hmm. Okay, but have you ever, well, you probably don't get the cold or flu very much. Very infrequently. Yeah. I think I had the flu <laughs> last November, 2020. Um, and I, I was actually doing some breath work because I, you know, I'm familiar with the immune response that, that you can elicit doing that. And, uh, it was not fun and I'm sure it helped me, but I was definitely not going to the degree that I normally do with my breath work practice. And it still lasted like five days, you know? Mm. Yeah. But I did a podcast about that on Friday. So people by this time will have already heard that whole journey. Uh, what really, inspired you to get into this in the beginning. I understand that both your mother and your son had some issues and that was right. part of the impetus for you to, to move forward with, with this uh, innovation. Right. Well, a long time ago, I spent like 25 years building a software company and first motivation more or less to exit that was that I found myself walking down the street after a chiropractic adjustment with a tear coming down my face because I had spent so much chair time writing code and I, when I finally got my back straightened out, I realized my body told me, I was like, Mark, you forgot what it feels like not to hurt. And that was what caused the tear. I'm like, well, I need to be thinking about something else to do. Shortly thereafter, my, my wife got a diagnosis of, I'm sorry, my mom got a diagnosis of small cell lung cancer. And, you know, I wrote a lot of patents uh, on information storage technology yeah, that eventually evolved into what they call blockchain. Um, but, oh, really? Yeah, oh, that wow. was my previous um, outside the conversation. But the you know, so whenever I need to learn about something, I'll go to the patent database. And so my mom had cancer, so I started researching cancer. I sat down. I remember the numbers. I sat down on Monday and researched and looked up the treatments for cancer. And on Monday, there were 1,972. I got busy. I'm like, wow, that's a lot. I came back on Wednesday and I sat down and I looked again. There were 1,976. In 73 days, 72 hours, the patent office had issued four more patents for treatment of cancer. Wow. I'm like, whoa, that's weird. So then I took the next two days and I read approximately a thousand patents because I just quick scanned them. And I said, well, any of them that appeared that they might have practical applicability. And I found two that were really good. One was by a brilliant guy named Hugh Riordan, uh, ran the bright spot for cancer or health in Kansas. And then the other one was by a guy named Panos Papas. And they were basically energetic and chemical, a IV vitamin C with lipoic acid. and then. The other one was pulsed electromagnetic fields. I thought, well, if I could use the pulse fields and my mom's oncologist at the time was willing to do IV vitamin C. So we backed her up with lipoic acid and we could use both of those. And sure enough, four months later, you know, her tumors went down and her numbers and she was all better. Wow. Went back to work. I'm like, wow, that was cool. 
Um, the, the sad side of the story is that she was cool, and then she went back to the oncologist, and he saw how healthy she looked, and he says, hey, Kawada, you look great. Let's give you some more chemo just to be safe. Oh, man. Damn. Four months later. Really? And <laughs> gone. Oh, man. Brutal. And I'm like, I'm watching this. I'm like, why? And, um, you know, like, I stewed on that for a while. I was like, these jokers need some competition, you know, because it was just, it was just bad. It broke my heart. It made me mad. And, you know, I know when incompetence, when I see it and I was just, it just, it just it tore me up. And then, um, some years later, that was just my, you know, reset to say, okay, there's more possible. And I was stunned at the scope of technology that was there just in the patents. And I was looking at what was practically available. I'm like, wait a minute, this, 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 this is not right. And then, you know, then you get into asking the question, why is all this great technology that's there and available? And at that point, most of the patents had buddy expired. So it was free to use, but what they were offering was so different. So anyway, that let me, you know, left me a little disoriented. I was like, okay, there's opportunity here. And then a few a few years later, um, my son was a piano. My kids all play, and and um, anyway, he started having twitches, uh, Tourette seizures, basically. And like, at what cool? age? Uh, probably eight. We really kind of nosed him eleven, and I started to work with oxygen. Um, pursuant to Dr. Manford von Arden. He did great research in the 70s. I'm like, well, and I had just started to, to for my own personal use, uh, kind of play with the oxygen, looking at the adaptive contrast because a few weeks earlier, I'd been up in the Rockies and we're climbing the hills and I noticed the only thing I could hear when I was climbing a mountain was my ear, you know, the heart pounding in my head. I'm like, well, that's interesting. I wonder what that is. And when I researched it, well, that's when I got to the point of like, well, by the time the body activates that blood flow circuit, you're slamming more, four times more blood through your brain. I'm like, wow. And I was like, well, if I could do that and if I could put the oxygen in there, maybe I could get a better job of oxygenating my brain. So anyway, when I Dak Dakota had the um, seizures, I, I gave him a neurological panel. And I looked at it and I was appalled because he had seven scores in the first and second percentile. And he was apparently neurologically normal. And I'm like, ooh, that's not good. Because when you're a parent, you see that with your kid. It's like, oh, crap. And um, so I said, well, let's try this. So I trained myself and I trained him. And I went back on. So this is Monday. And on a Wednesday, I took this. We both took the same test again. All right, his scores all moved. He went from five in the lowest category to two, and everything else moved to the left, meaning he had not just that he had a dramatic improvement. But what surprised me was my own scores went up by 17%. How that happened? And that led me to the notion that says, okay, well, there's something going on in the brain. And anyway, my kids are athletes, so he liked to feed archery and he liked to compete and more more importantly he liked to win what he discovered was that when he shot archery when he trained he was much more accurate wow so he wow. added the, the training to his um protocol and sure enough five six years later we did another one it's like all green all good okay well that was interesting because there was something he liked to do because he wanted to improve his own physical performance. But me as a parent kind of watching, okay, boy, I sure hope we can, he can have a normal life. And then all of a sudden he's normal life and prevailing. He's got his own business. And like, it's like there was nothing. Yeah, I met wrong. him downstairs. Well, that would be Hunter. Oh, that's a different one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's his little How many brother. kids do you have? I got three boys. Oh, okay. And um, with Dakota, did you at the time or subsequently have any idea what the origin of his issues might have been? I think it was because he got some shots when he was younger. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah. And because of that, and then I went into sort of understanding the etiology of what was happening. So basically, you take shot, there's aluminum and various other things that sludge the blood. And the problem is when you sludge the blood, the blood blocks the flow to the capillaries. And if that blood stays 
blocked for 90 minutes, it's like putting a tourniquet on and then you end up with a durable injury to the capillary. So the capillary swells shut or oh, swell wow. closed. So you end up with a durable, meaning potentially lifelong obstruction. And that basically will shut down a fraction of the body. And so when it happens in the brain, you see a loss of brain function. When it happens in the liver, you see, you know, a fraction of the organ shut down. Right. And so that's the basic mechanism of injury. You sludge the blood for 90 minutes, and then you end up with a closure of the vascular system to a potentially substantial percentage of the body. Right. And that's a, you know, lifelong loss of function. Wow. And what this guy Arden discovered is that if you hit those capillaries and those vascular networks with enough oxygen not on the red blood cells but dissolved in the water like the in the plasma in the plasma okay got it you know the normal amount of blood or oxygen in the plasma is cc three cubic centimeters per liter if you can get that to 12 which would be four times normal then that 12 cc's per liter is enough basically to reverse that inflammation or reverse that swelling and cause those endothelial cells or the capillary cells to go back to normal. Okay, so what was happening in terms of all of the stories I'm telling you about recoveries is, you know, it, as soon as that happens, the vascular system opens up. And anybody that wants to research that, I got to do is go look at a book by Manfred von Arden, uh, it was originally written in German and translated to English. Unfortunately, when I last time I looked, copies of this book are rare as hen's teeth and are over eight hundred dollars. Oh wow! But the point is, it's real wow. science. It's real. Yeah. Pra it's very practical, and it works every time. I've been into energetic healing technologies for many years, especially those that are supportive for EMF exposure. And there are a lot of so-called quantum products on the market, and I've tried just about any one I've ever heard of, but few of them have had any noticeable effect. However, there is one product line that's passed my test and become part of my arsenal, and it's called Leela Quantum Tech. Leela Quantum has developed a groundbreaking technology to increase your energy level, become more stress resistant, and also helps to support your whole family, pets, and garden with pure quantum energy. The Leela Quantum products have been certified and studied by various third-party institutes and doctors, and these studies have found significant improvements in people's blood, cellular voltage, allergy reduction, and heart rate variability. But my favorite benefit of all is that the Leela Quantum products help neutralize harmful frequencies, including any EMF like 4G, 5G, microwaves, and Wi-Fi. In fact, I have the Leela Quantum block in my kitchen where I charge my food, drinks, and supplements, as well as the Infinity block in my living room and here in the studio for a huge energetic upgrade. Leela Quantum Tech is a truly conscious business that wants to do good in the world and even plants a tree for every order. So if you want to hook up your energetic environment and have a tree planted on your behalf, you can go to leelaq.com and use the code LUKE10 to save 10% off your first order. That's L-E-E-L-A-Q.com and the discount code is LUKE10 for new customers. So when you had the success with your son Dakota and his archery performance and, you know, easing these neurological issues and then subsequently your own performance, you know, going up unbeknownst to you. Was this an early iteration of this technology that you kind of cobbled together using different things? Was it essentially yeah, it was like, a more, like a more primitive version of what you now have as a, yeah, it was as a, a company? Primitive, but the principle was the same, which is, you know, the challenge phase, you, you know, if you try to activate the respiratory or the breathing process while you're breathing pure oxygen, the problem is you can't work out hard enough and you'll injure yourself because you've got so much oxygen that the vascular system more or less stays closed and the heart uh. rate stays low. So the trick was to go ahead and trick the vascular system into maximum flow by exerting under low oxygen conditions so that when you switched, you could basically have maximum pressure. So like if it's, a, if, a, if it's a problem in the brain, you've got the pulse force. If you think of a fire hose with a nozzle, you know, the nozzle, you really want the fire hose as wide as possible, which happens when you 
train under low oxygen conditions or exert under low oxygen conditions, and you want the pump at the backside, basically slamming the blood through that as hard as possible so that you the blood will penetrate the occlusion. And once that happens, if you get the 12 cc's, like the super oxygenated blood to go through there, then it normalizes the metabolism of these endothelial cells and they'll pump out the sodium and go back to normal size and go back to normal function. So once this open up opens up, the blood flow starts going through like Drano. And then once blood starts to go through, the oxygen can diffuse. So all of the cells that were fed by this blog will start to work again. Wow. So when we talk about the Dakota and the Mark scenario of where, how, do, how did this work? Well, this had happened enough that parts of his brain weren't working right as parts of my brain. Once we opened that up, it started to fire up and then like, wow. But in my case, it was 17% of measured functional IQ. Wow. That's crazy. And I was like, that was just the workout. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I just remembered something uh, from those few years ago when I went and uh, used your technology at uh, the Upgrade Labs in Santa Monica. And I didn't, you know, as I said, I didn't really understand the mechanism of action. I just saw an oxygen concentrator and this bag, and then I had a mask on. And I've been planning on, this is funny, I don't think I'm going to do this now. And if I did, it sounds ineffective, but, you know, I have my hyperbaric chamber home. So I have a concentrator and I have this Carol bike, this high intensity Mm -hmm. interval bike uh, that just smokes you. And so what I've been planning on doing is just putting on a cannula and getting on that bike with my oxygen concentrator. And it doesn't sound like that's going to do the same thing that your technology does. No, if you marry the two, the Carol with the Livo 2. Yeah. We'll rock your socks. I bet. But just breathing a higher concentration of oxygen and working out isn't going to give me the same effects you're talking about because I'm not going to get the plasma saturation and all of Well, all you'll this. get increased plasma saturation and you will get definitive benefits, Yeah, but they won't be profound. Got it. Okay. Because so I'm, I'm not going to get the oxygen deprivation, I guess. You're not going to get the oxygen. Unless I held my breath or something, right? I mean. Well, and then probably not. So, okay. the, you know, the key thing there is to achieve simultaneous maximums of okay. blood flow and oxygen concentration in the circulating blood. Okay. And in order to achieve the maximum blood flow, you really need to be in a hypoxic condition, low oxygen. And it's that switch that creates the magic moment where you're breathing low oxygen air. Your body's like, ah, I got it. Good, ah. And then you hit and then boom, with all that flow active, and then you get the rush of oxygen and the few heartbeats that follow are where the magic is. Uh, And that's why I use the phrase magic moment because it doesn't take long. I mean, seconds, two breaths in the right condition. It's just like unlocking a key or turning off a switch. As soon as that super oxygenated blood hits those occluded or, you know, challenged cells, they say, oh, <sighs> okay, and then they, they will switch back to normal. And this is our DENS research. And, I mean, we've been doing it. We've done it for thousands and thousands of people, and it, 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 it really works. Wow, so cool, so cool. And it's simple, but back to your, you know, your reality between yeah. the Carol bike and, et cetera, and the, you know, the oxygen. I would say, I mean, the cannula solution will work, but, you know, you would... <laughs> You know, just well, I'm, like glad, I'm, I'm glad to hear it, it's not going to put me in danger because oftentimes I think because of the work I do, I, I'm kind of the canary in the coal mine and I'll try some stuff. I'll, you know, I do a little bit of research and I don't do anything I think too reckless or dangerous, but I just kind of put two and two together and I try things. And if it works, then I report to people. But the benefit of my job is I get to talk to people like you. And if something does have deleterious effects, I'm probably going to learn about it before I actually go and pull a dumbass stunt and try it on my own, like doing breath work and falling on the ground. Um, then I can report back, like, don't do this at home, kids, kind of thing, you know? So let's see. So we covered a lot of the things that I wanted to cover here. Uh, I know what I want to go into is um, brain function. So I know in in the oxygen therapy world, TBIs and just cognitive issues and things like this, which is why I got into doing the hyperbarics is, um, you know, one of the I think most abundant benefits. What have you seen with this type of training, the oxygen training versus therapy, when it comes to brain injuries and you know the cascade of possible, um, you know, mental deficiencies, mental illness, emotional problems, just because our brains are are lacking blood flow to key parts to keep them all working. Right. So if I speak in terms of 
functional optimization. You know, the I'll call it the IQ differential. Yeah, the brain's an organ just like anything else, and it if it has the resources to make energy, it will work more efficient. And so, whenever you have an injury, like you know, a concussion or something like that, basically, if it's a mild concussion, the brain gets smushed up against the side, and it basically gets a bruise. And if the blood flow is limited, then that bruise will interfere with the corresponding tissue as long as it lasts. And it turn, you know, because most people don't often create that, that. Like for example, if you look at TBI, you know, they'll end up with parts of the brain shut off over time. Well, eventually the brain will adapt, and it'll, they call it neuroplasticity, and it'll learn how to do the same job using different circuits. But that takes years. So in this case, you just basically blast you know, it through. And what we've seen, like in terms of, and we've done, I'll call it pop-ups, where we take a group of people and say, okay, we'll set up a training circuit and we'll test them in the beginning, like on Monday. And they'll do the circuit for five days and we'll test them again on Friday. And if you use the standard of how they would describe their quality of life on Friday versus Monday, um, our success rate is 100%. Okay, of the people that have had, I'll call it, a sequence of recent mild concussions, recent being five years or less, about half of them will say, I feel completely normal by Friday. Wow, that's crazy. Um, and that's it's just, crazy fast, because in contrast, like when I, you know, I didn't even have a TBI that I'm aware of, but when I went and saw Dr. Amen and he kind of prescribed 100 hyperbaric sessions in rapid succession, like mm -hmm. within a short period of time, uh, I mean, that's, that's a long time and that's a lot of hours and hours. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're talking, each one is two hours a piece yeah. and a hundred. Yeah. So you're looking at two hours, 200 hours of dwell time. <laughs> I like that the dwell time because that's, that's what you're doing. I mean, I keep myself occupied, but your average person I think would go crazy doing that many hyperbaric sessions, you know, to get the desired result. Right. Well, and you know, when you start to think about the brain, it's your emotion, your perception of the world, your spiritual your relationships with your family. And so if, you know, I don't want to necessarily talk so much about the quote unquote recovery, but if you try to measure the people that we work with in terms of their perception of the world and how they feel, their ability to have good relationships, you know, once the brain's well oxygenated, especially if there's a part that wasn't well oxygenated that is now and that starts to work, then their ability to reckon and understand kind of comes back on. And then they drop out of this need to respond to things with anxiety. So like a very typical thing, like I'm calm. All right. Another one that's really big is a lot of the people that have had successive concussions, they'll be dependent on two, three, you know, substances. You know, even if they're not prescription, they'll use them to self-medicate because they have to in order to cope with their reality because they have to numb it down or they can't get by. And so once they, you know, start oxygenating the brain, things start working right, then their need or, you know, their need to self-medicate tends to go away. And so it's just like everything about them, you know, starts to bubble and glow their ability to have healthy relationships improves because their behavior is predictable, calm, stable, or more stable. And it's just beautiful. But at the end of the day, the brain's, the ability of the cells in the brain to produce energy are what enable normal, happy behavior. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I mean, if you think about when you're uh, sleep deprived, right? And your executive function, cognitive function is taxed you're irritable. You know, the person cuts you off or you perceive them to be cutting you off. I mean, just basic examples like that. I know for myself, I'm much more testy when my brain is not firing on all cylinders, let alone you've actually had a legitimate TBI or uh, even a PTSD experience of some kind, right? I mean, it's like you're kind of always in that fight or flight, amygdala firing response where anything could set you off. And you know, that is going to ultimately affect uh, all of your relationships, like whether they're, um, you know, more remote, distant relationships or your immediate family and loved ones, et cetera. I mean, I know when my brain was in bad shape earlier in life before I really started uh, healing and working on myself, I mean, I was a, a, a much less kind person, <laughs> generally speaking, much more reactive, short-tempered, short patience, 
couldn't focus, crazy brain fog. And when you're in that state, I mean, it's, it's frustrating. Even if you're a kind hearted person, you can't often meet your own standards because your brain just doesn't give you the capacity to operate on that level. Well, there are two, two main things. Number one, you look in the mirror and you watch yourself from the outside in. It's like, what have I become? And then you question, and that's depressing. And then the other thing from a quality of life point of view is, you know, losing that rational you because something's organically wrong. It's not your fault, but it feels like it's your fault. But when you go out and you try to present yourself or have value in, I'll call it a work relationship, your ability to monetize or make money is inhibited by the fact that you've lost the ability to control your emotions, especially under the challenging situations. So every aspect of your being and your productivity and your relationship tends to take, you know, take a hit. And you know, living in that state where your brain's not working right, it, 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 it eats you away because you, 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 you have to work and it exhausts you because you have to work so hard to try to be normal. Right, right. Yeah, it's like you have to actually exert energy to be a good person, even if you really are one in your heart, you know, which I believe. Well, you're trying, most people are. Yeah. But, and the, the whole notion in terms of the, you know, the life challenge that, you know, the, I'll call it just the concussion, you know, so we have lots of source, you know, people hit, you know, playing concussive sports, but not knowing what they need to do to restore their brain function. And so, like, what we see is, you know, especially, People that play contact sports and military and other, they get on this and like, wow, man, I feel normal again. And if they have the tool, they can continue to do whatever. But instead of having a, I'll call it a durable damage, you know, they'll just kind of bounce back and stay normal through their career. So one of our things is to like, you know, get these into the hands of people that are, you know, play rough. And because of that, they'll, number one, enjoy the anti-aging process, meaning they'll get old slower and they will recover better and they just won't accumulate the damage like, you know, the fighters and MMA and the guys that, you know, play the play rough. They end up having a, I'll call it a pretty degenerative lifestyle yeah, because yeah. of the accumulation of the injuries that happen because they don't have the technology just to, you know, kind of recover on the fly. I, I, I'm not, you know, we we're talking, you were naming some sports people earlier and I'm just like blank stare. I don't know what you're talking about because I don't know about sports, but yeah, I live in Austin. Some of my friends are a bit sporty and they'll have, you know, these MMA or cage fights on and, and I can barely watch it because I just look at the brain damage that they're incurring. I mean, you just see someone, I was watching a documentary about a, a female, um, fighter the other day and just watching them just get pummeled in the head over and over again. And I'm just like, ah, oh, that's your brain, man. Like you're getting hit in the brain. And I'm just like, no, stop, stop, you know? And uh, yeah, it's heartbreaking. I mean, people that, that are just wired that way, that are just rough and tumble, um, man, that's a, that's a, a rough path to go down if you don't have, you know, what you're describing, like a powerful means by which to actually recover and recuperate from that. That's well, crazy. Just if the fighters and the football players would add this, you know, like your average uh, NFL lineman, I think the average age that they die is like 45, maybe 55. Uh -huh. You know, they don't live long because they're quali like Junior Seo. Um, they, they don't live long because they experience 20, well, it's just like the movie Concussion. They get all of this damage and it just destroys their ability to be normal. And because, and that's true across the military and you know, the kids that come back, I think I heard a statistic that roughly 75% of the army, people in the army ends up with enough post-concussive damage to require very significant lifetime disability. I mean, so wow. the, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, you know, con brain, brain damage is an epidemic. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's, that's true. Whenever I go shooting, you know, I'm always thinking about, you know, I'm shooting, relatively i mean much less substantial firearms than people in the military and even that i mean you can kind of if you do like a slow motion video of someone shooting a firearm it, mm -hmm. there's a concussive effect of that mm -hmm. ballistic and you think these guys are out there with heavy artillery for months sometimes years on end people in combat and they're just getting rattled i mean not even including injuries right of you know a mortar going off near you or something like that man so there's there's a lot of people out there that are doing a lot of harm to themselves because of the career that they've chosen or enjoy. 
Well, it's, you know, so if, you know, I'm a parent, obviously. And so when you look at young people, I look at, you know, the people coming, I mean, even somebody 30 or 40, I, st I could still consider them kids. And it breaks my heart to see them, you know, them go through, you know, life with these injuries that interfere with their ability to be human. Okay. Yeah, and then yeah. to realize that, you know, a lot of this stuff is actionable. And it's inexpensive. And so that's why I'm so passionate about, no, oh, man, no, man, you got to do this. And, you know, and then go back to your earlier question, training versus therapy. It's like, no, man, if you just train in a way that oxygenates your brain, the darn thing will heal, live. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I think we think of our brain uh, when something goes wrong as it's permanent, but you don't, you don't think about like, if you cut your arm, you're not like, oh man, it's going to stay bleeding forever. Right. It's yeah. just a matter of time. Make sure you don't get an infection and your body has its own innate wisdom and it's going to kind of reform itself back into the blueprint of health, provided you don't do anything that prevents that. And I think we kind of lose touch with the fact that our brain can be restored. And also now knowing what we know about neuroplasticity, I mean, I, I'm smarter now today for sure than I've ever been in my whole life. And I don't mean just, you know, accumulated wisdom, but actual mental prowess. And, you know, some people listening might disagree, but <laughs> <laughs> like, really do. But subjectively, I mean, sometimes I just, you know, cause I'm doing all kinds of things. I mean, I'm interviewing people like you and I'm like, okay, I'm adding that to my arsenal and I'm, you know, doing neurofeedback and God knows, you know, different types of nootropics and things for brain health. And it's like, I feel like my brain is aging in reverse. I'm having less brain fog, more cognitive abilities, and also just, you know, neurotransmitters and hormones and just feeling happier and more fulfilled all the time when our kind of standardized model of aging is based on um, assumed degradation of your quality of life and your cognition. I mean, we all know, ah, oh, someone's getting old. They got to say your name five times. You know, I remember my grandmother, you know, she, as she aged and God bless her, she eventually ended up with dementia and passed away. But, you know, she, she'd call me like, her son's name, you know, her uncle's name, my cousin's name, my brother's <laughs> name, you know, go through five names before she finally hit Luke, you know? And I remember being a kid going, wow, she seems to be doing that a lot more. And so if that's what you're, is if that's what you're observing, then you just kind of take that for granted. You think, oh, as we get older, you know, we just kind of lose it. And then eventually someone has to take care of you. And I've never liked that idea, especially as I'm, you know, when I hit 50, I was like, okay, I got to get serious here. Like I want to be getting better all the time, not declining all the time well yeah so you know go uphill the um i i you know based on what i'm saying it's really not necessary to go downhill and um another thing i'll mention is like you know as we all age you know we tend to become more spiritual one of the things that we hear and i experience is like you know if you think about your connection to whatever you consider source and your ability to be empathetic and understand what's going on and feel. Um, I, you know, now that I'm probably a decade into this whole process, I'm like, I feel a lot more ability to sort of just sense what's going on. And in relationships, like for example, my relationship with my wife is much better. I've become a better person just because I'm on in, you know, being able to say, wow, maybe I was being a dickhead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. just being able to look at myself and my own yeah. emotions like we had an issue when we first got here I'm like okay all right, I know what I feel but here's how I probably should manage this and I need to for the benefit of others you know not go with what my emotions say to do or whatever I need to break with that and to be able to say okay I'm making a decision to do that you know really a higher level thing and do something that totally contradicts and feel upright about it what my instincts say yeah yeah and you know but it gets into feeling and being able to operate at a higher level and to do that consistently so that you know like if you're running a company you know it's like you got to make a thousand decisions you know meantime between messages is what a few seconds and being able to sit stay calm and not be a bonehead and to remain compassionate with the people that are having their own struggles as they're going through, especially in the past couple of years, you know, I, it's, it's hard at the beginning, but, you know, as you develop or, you know, what I really feel is like the ability to avoid succumbing to the stress. And, you know, if I start to feel like, get on train, 
okay, number one, that helps you get rid of the corticoids because you're exerting. But number two, it brings you to the point of saying, okay, what's really going on here? And more importantly, which is what is the best thing for me to do under these circumstances, which is to not always do what your instinct says, but yeah. to, or, to, to, or to evolve your higher instinct that says, okay, I'm yeah. going to act like this because that's for everybody's best. Yeah. But to be in a way where you can feel that as you're going. So like if you're a CEO, I mean, man, it makes a big difference in your ability, in my ability to cope. And I suggest it's certainly among my staff. So anybody who works for me, you got a system. And when you start to act goofy, <laughs> you need to train. And that's about as far as I ever end up going in terms of complaining about anybody, because once they go and train and come back, I've got that nice person that I love working with back at the table. If you were lucky enough to hear episode 389 with Dr. Chris Wrench, you'll understand how important mitochondria is to your energy levels and overall health. So I'm always looking for ways to upgrade my mitochondria and age as slowly as possible through supplements and biohacks. My latest obsession in this category is something called MitoPure, a breakthrough postbiotic that activates your body's natural defense against aging and assists in mitophagy or the clearing out of old bogus mitochondria. It's the first product to offer a precise dose of a compound derived from pomegranate called urolithin A, which is a truly groundbreaking discovery. In fact, MitoPure is the result of over 10 years of research by scientists at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. You can get your daily dose of 500 milligrams of MitoPure by using the berry powder, which I add to my smoothies, yogurt, and other drinks. And they also have a vanilla protein powder for muscle building and also soft gels for on-the-go convenience. This is a powerful and super easy way to upgrade mitochondrial function, increase cellular energy, and improve muscle strength. If that sounds like a good plan to you, here's what you do to get on a MitoPure subscription. Visit TimelineNutrition.com. And right now, as a special offer for you Lifestylist listeners, you can use the code LUKE10 to get 10% off any 2, 4, or 12-month MitoPure plan at TimelineNutrition.com. Well, I like what you were saying about um, at, you know, how just brain function and overall well-being and health pertains to our spirituality. I think that you know, on one extreme of the spectrum, you have the yogi, the meditator that is in denial of the physical body because you know that the fundamental teaching that we're not our body, right? So on one side, you know, you just go live in a cave and eat rice and just kind of discount the whole physical experience and nothing wrong with that. It's a path. Um, but I think it's kind of missing a full integration perhaps. And on the other side, you have like the extreme biohacker that thinks they're going to supplement their way into enlightenment, right? <laughs> and, you know, forget that we are more than the body, that we are the body, but we're also not the body. And I know that um, in my own experience, kind of going back to that mental and emotional health, it's like, man, if you're just fighting for survival and your biology is suffering, it's very difficult to find the time to then go meditate or read spiritual literature or join a spiritual group or do whatever you know your uh, act of faith is and to really integrate that into your lifestyle. Because man, you're just fighting to survive. You know, you're just you're in that fight or flight perpetual cycle where you're just trying to keep you know, kind of hold the spring down and not freak out and lose your shit and have a nervous breakdown or a divorce or get fired or you fold your company or whatever your position is. It's like you tell someone like that, hey, you know, have you ever thought about working on your faith or developing a relationship with God or exploring spirituality? It's like, who has time for that when you're constantly in a survival state of anxiety and fear and depression and, you know, just what comes along with that? You, there's just no room for that when you don't have the vitality. So it's always something I'm trying to kind of bob and weave with to find the balance of taking care of my body, but not forgetting about the spiritual aspect of, of life, which I think is fundamentally for all of us, the thing that gives life meaning, right? When you know that you're connected to something greater and as you develop that connection, you share with other people and it becomes just kind of part of who you are rather than something that's segregated into a compartment of your life. Yeah, well, okay, so... Imagine a happy spirit. Okay, how long is a happy spirit or how well is a happy spirit going to be or do in a miserable body? Okay, so the happy body, happy spirit, 
when you've got the happy spirit, you know, being a part of the world, being a part of the relationships, all of that. So, you know, you can't, you, you have to care about the body. You can't just ignore it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but, you know, anything that you can do in terms of keeping the body perfect or healthy also comes back in the spirit. And so when you want to talk about spiritual pursuits, whether it's being spiritual, being integrated with others, being part of, you know, a, a happy community, the more you can do or the more you can be open and happy about that, then you, it's almost impossible to be happy in a miserable body. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. I've been there. I, I've had the converse. I mean, I've had both. I've been relatively fit, but just mentally so toxic <laughs> that I wasn't happy, but I've had the other one. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the improvement in your relationship due to just emotional regulation, right? And having that pause button and a little bit of a, I guess, a witness perspective where you kind of observe the things rising and falling within you and you're able to manage that and not be so reactive um, on the relationship and closeness, intimacy. Uh, what about sexual performance with this type of training? Uh, I know that there's uh, one of the applications of hyperbaric, by mm -hmm. the way, and I'm sure you know this for the audience is erectile dysfunction, which I didn't I didn't even know that when I got my chamber, but it, it's true. <laughs> you know, it's definitely increases uh, sexual performance. Let, let's put it that way. Have you had any anecdotal reports of that or oh. is there any data on, on that element of the training? Well, I'll tell you a story that one of the gentlemen came up from the Keys. All right. I met him on an island in the Everglades and he ended up getting our system. And anyway, he called me. He said, Mark, six months later, how to get a divorce. Jeff, why? My wife didn't want to have sex three times a day. <laughs> so, you know, then that's the other part, which is the balance, which is that, you know, he went down a health recovery path and, you know, he had been going downhill and then all of a sudden he started going uphill. He's the same guy that as of today, you know, he was happy to be here with us. He spent, you know, what, three days on his feet uh, and college weight college performance, you know, he's 56 and he's still performing as well as he was in college, you know, so he wanted to make the journey back to live and be life. And she was like off in another direction. So, you know, but with respect to the sexual, that's one of the things that we, you know, our customers say is like, wow, man. And, you know, so we've developed strategies to optimize that as a specific focus. But what's interesting is it's usually, you know, the women, because they're more in touch with themselves, they, you know, they start all of a sudden their body gets happy again and libido starts to fire and they go to hubby and say, Hey, I think you should try this. <laughs> Get okay. on my live O2 machine. Well, yeah. And then, and then yeah. all of a sudden, you know, they end up going back some time because, you know, the passion comes back into the relationship because, well, and that's another dimension of love. So that intimacy, and that also kind of feeds back into the way they, you know, the way they love each other. It's like, shit, they're having the same fun they were 20 years ago. Okay, yeah, and then all yeah. of a sudden the relationship becomes solid and people with solid relationships have better quality of life. So there's this ray wave ripple effect where it's just the benefits cascade to, wow, man, life is good, if not great. How often are you uh, training these days? Every day. Really? Yeah, well, I missed one day. Um, but it's like, if I don't train, you know, especially under quote unquote, the stress of modern day, yeah, I, I really feel it. Wow. Um, Damn, that's impressive. You know, sometimes I think when people have innovations and, you know, they're excited about it for a while and they create a company around it. Uh, I sense that some of them kind of lose the luster for it, the passion for it. And they're just kind of get wrapped up in the business and maybe don't do it. So that's, that's pretty cool that you're still getting after it. Oh, there's no choice, um, you know, because what happens is you get used to feeling good. Yeah. And it's, it's, I won't say it's addictive, but boy, when you start not feeling good and you start to lose that, it, it's like, no, shit, I got to get back there because, you know, you just, you know, life's good. And, you know, but with all the stress, the strange things that are going on, you know, the weirdness that's manifesting in the people around us, you know, being able to, you know, stay separate. And, you know, observe that without, and to manage your emotional entanglements with everybody you'd like to care about, realize, you know, what is it? God grant me the wisdom to accept the things I cannot change, you know, and operating yeah. in that spiritual awareness that says, look, you know, 
Some things are going to work out. Some things are not. Some people are going to do well. Some people are not. And then just saying, look, if they're acting in a way you don't think they're going to have a good fate, then you probably want to just let it go. But, you know, a big part of the ability to do that is to have your close circle of people you can love and feel comf comfortable with and to have the best possible relationship with them. But e the ability to do that really comes back to, well, you know, do I feel whole? And that says, well, how do I spend my time? And how do I spend my energy trying to help others? But if I'm falling apart or, you know, starting to suffer myself, I can't do that because, and that gets back to, you know, in terms of filling what I think my mission in life is, I have to take the best possible care of myself. And that's what the training does. Because if I don't, I feel it literally the next day. Wow. And how uh, long is a training session typically? For beginners, we do like 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. For me, you know, I'm kind of, I've been at it for a while. So I like to train at very high altitudes and short. So it's an aggressive kind of brain O2 kind of workout. Um, so I like 30 to 45. Oh, wow. And I, I like to finish with, you know, 30 minutes in a sauna where I'll sweat. Yeah. Unfortunately, I usually, on my days, I end up at my desk seven hours or something. So the 30 minutes of active is often what I, the only thing I get but yeah. on a happy day I get to do the sauna I've been working on improving my sleep for the past 15 years and it's been quite a journey to say the least I've learned so much over the years and every habit I've put into practice has helped move the needle to some degree or another however one of the most effective things I've done is to block out all light at night and sleep in a pitch black room now, while I'm at home, that's easier to do because, of course, I can buy window coverings that do the job. But when I'm traveling or I'm somewhere where I want to take a nap or meditate, I need a mask that is going to solve the problem of light leaks. The Remedy Sleep Mask from Blue Blocks is the best solution I've found. I also sometimes sleep in different positions, so I needed a mask that worked for all of them. And the Remedy does the job for all sleeping styles. It's also got an adjustable strap rather than elastic, which means you can get the perfect fit on all skull shapes and sizes. And I also love the adjustable eye cups so you can fully open your eyes when wearing the masks and your eyes don't get smashed while you're sleeping. And this is, of course, great for people with long eyelashes as it applies zero pressure to the eyes. But most importantly, it's 100% blackout like sleeping in pitch black darkness, which is really the whole point of wearing a mask. The Remedy Mask is something I always bring with me when I travel, and it's very useful on airplanes, hotels, and for me, even here in the studio for my afternoon naps and meditations. So if you have difficulty napping or meditating or just poor sleep and frequent awakenings, the Remedy Mask is a game changer. Here's what you do to snatch up a couple of these handy masks. Go to blueblocks.com slash lifestylist and use the code lifestylist to save 15% off. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com slash lifestylist. And again, the code is also lifestylist to save 15%. Well, this, you know, last bit kind of speaks to the stress resilience we were talking about earlier, right? I mean, I think we've kind of covered that in general. But because you're putting your body under stress, right? Undue stress. I mean, you're talking about basically simulating these altitude changes and oxygen changes. What about resilience to physical stress? You know, not just kind of the emotional stuff we're talking about, but athletic performance and things like that in terms of recovery and being able to withstand the stress of really pushing yourself physically. Well, if you if you go take a look at, you know, our athlete customers, I mean, we've got some very, very, probably if you name the most famous athletes on the th scene today you know they end up using as a recovery tool and especially the older ones that are, are well known the principle there's there's two i guess number one the anti-aging which is the ability for an older athlete if i quote one of them uh, let's see i think his famous phrase was come to papa <laughs> Um, because he's an older fighter and he just invited a younger fighter, I think 24 years old, to come to Papa, you know, in his next round, I think in December. Yeah, the principle is that, you know, if you're young and, you know, if you're old, it doesn't matter. It's just a number. Like that's, that would be Dara Torres, one of our other customers. The principle is like, you know, it's, it's just a number, you know, feeling young, feeling strong, being resilient and, you know, having fun 
and I'm sorry, I don't know if I answered the question, <laughs> but it's a state of being, yeah, like yeah. being alive and, yeah. you know, forget about how old you are, just go live. And being able to do that, enjoy it is key. And that's part of that is just let, being in a position and a, and a mental and physical place where the stress rolls off and it doesn't take you down. Like, and in today's world, it's like, it, it, it's a pandemic of stress. Yeah. Am I going to get fired if I don't do certain things? And how do I deal with this? And, you know, just letting the insecurity of all the bizarre pressures we're under make you feel afraid. And I think that's probably the biggest part, which is once you take the fear of your body failing off the table, which is I'm secure in the way I feel, I'm secure in my own physical strength, I'm secure in my emotional strength, that gives you a great amount of resilience to not feel threatened by all the crap that's going on. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. that gets into just, okay, I'm solid. I feel good. Okay. Well, if you feel good, you can say, well, that's bullshit. I will <laughs> discard the bullshit and you can walk away from it without getting drawn into it. And I think in terms of my own life, when I talk about the training, it's like when I get on, I'm like, oh, that's bullshit. Arr. And when I get off, it's like, that's bullshit. And the emotionally being emotionally attached to bullshit versus saying, you know, that's bullshit. I'm not attaching to that. And the strength to just walk away realizing that as long as you don't accept it and carry it, it's not part of you. It might have consequences in your life, but that's the real thing. And I think if you go back to the brain, having the brain that's able to say, I see that as something that I don't have to accept and to have the strength and the absence of fear just to let it go. Let it be the tar baby. Not, not touching that. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of brings me to something I wanted to cover with you. And I, I think this is universally true of technologies like yours and also the mindset that's sort of developing out of this medical industrial complex tyranny is that I think people that work, I, I mean, there's a certain category of people that just do what they're told and watch their TV and the TV told me to, and they just sort of sheepishly and blindly walk toward the cliff without asking questions or having any, any sort of discernment. Um, and not, you know, to be critical of those people, they're just, the programming is very effective, right? It's like mass hypnosis. So there's that category of people and God bless them. And I hope they find their way. Um, but there are people like you and me and so many people here uh, this weekend in Florida that are going, you know what? Like, I'm actually going to take responsibility for my own well-being, whether it be physical, immunity, um, mental attitude, emotional stability, um, all of it, and not even have to kind of put energy into fighting this system that we've grown to, and, and reasonably and rightfully so, uh, lose trust and faith in because of so much corruption and incompetence. But I see a world kind of emerging now where hopefully people listening to this podcast are going to find out what you're doing and so many other people that I have conversations with on the show and go, you know what? I don't have to tear down that system. I'm building my own thing, right? I'm going to invest in myself and invest in my own health and just opt out as much as possible and leave that system there for perhaps acute injuries or situations in which I have no other choice. And that's how I've been living my life for a long time. And, uh, encouraging other people to do. It's like to not give up your power and your sovereignty to a system that by and large is not really built to support you, but it's a system based on monetary incentives. And within those monetary incentives comes, you know, a lot of corruption oftentimes, not to disparage everyone in the medical community. I know a lot of doctors personally that are great people mm -hmm. and their mission is to help people and heal people. And I know there are many, but by and large, where we are in the world now is kind of like, you're either going to opt into that system and perhaps be stuck in there forever based on decisions that some people are making now um, to experiment well, forever in forever may not ways. be a very long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, forever, forever being as long as your lifespan is, if you start to get entangled in this mess. Um, and so I think it's really exciting now. And I, I always like you were saying, rather than, you know, going, that's bullshit. I mean, ah, negative about it. It's like, okay, to me and my perspective at this moment, a lot of this is bullshit. 
So what's the alternative? The alternative is I'm going to interview people like you and I'm going to learn more and I'm going to spend my resources on things that are supportive of my health and uh, use my resources to support my friends and family, to help educate people that like, this is your body, man. It's the only thing that you really own. It really is all, I think, metaphysically and physically, all that you own is the sovereignty of your body and your health and well-being. And daddy, <laughs> big pharma ain't going to do it for you. And if you voluntarily give that up, then there could be, not always, but could be consequences. You know, So I think what you're doing is really empowering. It really is. It's important, man, for all of us to start to understand how these bodies work and to be able to you know, do some research and find alternative ways of caring for ourselves. I mean, I'm, as you said, I very rarely get a cold or flu or anything like that, let alone any other serious problems. I do my labs every couple of years. They look great. My metabolic age is much younger than my chronological age. Like I'm living proof that it can be done, you know? So I appreciate the work that you're doing there. What do you, what do you have to say for people maybe that, that hear that statement and that go, yeah, yeah. I want to do that. You know, how does one kind of just take responsibility for themselves and just own their body and learn how to take care of it and start to become in essence, their own physician, I guess you could say. Well, I, I'm started having kids again when I was 40. <laughs> again, how many, how many do you have total? Well, my wife had two before we started. Oh, okay. So she okay. started again and I kind of started for the first time, but okay. we cranked out a batch and, and, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, as I was through that, I, I was like, went through the experience with my mom and then, you know, my oldest son, I'm like, oh my God. And then during the, especially, the, the, especially after my son, I started to really be concerned, if not afraid about, okay, if this is how that technology is working, I want nothing to do with it. Okay. So in about, what, 2004, I said, I ain't paying them some bitches no more. I stopped paying insurance. I said, I'm going to take my money and I'm going to spend it on stuff that I can use to keep everybody I care about out of the system. And that's what kind of led me to like being aggressive because I put my money where my mouth is, which is I am not, you know, no matter what they provide, I don't want it. Because I had that at that point started seeing that everybody that was in the system was going downhill. The there were no there was no pursuit of improvement. It was just like, okay, the word treatment. And I was like, as that language started to settle in, like, you know, okay, well, you can treat. Well, that's basically palliative care. We're gonna make you hurt less until whatever. And I was like, man, I don't want to live like that. And I don't want anybody that I care about or love to have to live under that. So I kind of put myself up to the process like, okay, I will find and I will equip my house with the stuff I need to take care of me and mine, my neighbor. And, you know, I very much li have lived by that philosophy for the past 15 years. In the beginning, I didn't quite have the tools and, you know, Livo2, the product, is one of the things that I ended up creating because it didn't exist, but mostly because I needed it because I wanted to be able to divorce myself from as much of the system. And so the reason I'm so enthusiastic about it is because now I've seen it and I've seen it with literally thousands of other people. And what I'm saying is true is like, if you have that tool, many of the things that will go wrong or could go wrong, and if you use it, they won't. You know, you'll stay in better shape. All of the diseases that would happen to you because you don't get enough oxygen to some part of your body probably won't happen. All of the injuries that wouldn't normally heal will probably heal. So as you take that thought stream, you know, forward looking, you know, through getting old. Uh, it's a tool that if you have that tool, um, you really need, you, well, the number of circumstances under which you'll need, I'll call it, to resort to 
that other healthcare system, it goes way down. I mean, like only one of my children has ever set foot in a doctor's office. Really? Ever. Damn, man. And I just told you the story of how that ended, which it was a wow. five-year salvage project. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, you know, so it's like, okay, getting out and just not, and, and having that independence. So, you know, with respect, so what we've done with the development of the product is look for strategies. So like we talked about the brain, well, there's other ones that focus on the pelvic floor for sexual function. And there's one that focuses on the stomach and, and, and the skin, uh, like five years How ago. How many years of age are you? Or 60. You you're 60. Dude, your skin looks incredible. <laughs> like, honestly, I've been sitting here wondering, how old is this dude? Well, okay, so but back... You, you got some gray hair, so I was like, well, he's older I, than th me. Those are earned. He's older than me, <laughs> but, like, you're... Honestly, I'm not I'm not shitting, and those on watching the video, like, your skin looks incredible. Thank you. I'm sure that has something to do with you doing your technology every day. Well, the story goes with that. Is like, I, I, that would be skin O2. Okay, but back a few years ago, back in 2012, my house burned down. And we were part of one of the big fires in Colorado. And I ended up trying to build a company, trying to build a house, and I didn't want to be under any debt. And so um, I said, what's going on? And I reached up, and my hair was falling out. I was developing a bald spot. I'm like, okay, what's going on there? And then I realized that, okay, what's happening is the stress and you know the blood flow to the hair follicles was being compromised. So I said, oh, I know how to fix that. And that's when I started to develop the more specific protocols. So like, for example, if you take a little niacin, it causes the... Um, capillaries and the you know the vessels and stuff in the skin to dilate and open up because you flush red and you itch well i was like wow what happens what would happen if i took a shot of niacin before i get on and train so i got them opened up and then you train and all of a sudden the blood flushes to the skin and so like you know one of our fun things to do is you take some woman and say or some man and say okay uh here you would you like to look a little younger I'm like, sure okay Take a shot of niacin, like the 500 milligram capsule, before you get on Livo 2. Sure enough, in two or three days, the extra the collagen will regenerate, you know. And in my case, it was like I didn't want my hair to fall out. And right now, I have just about as much hair as I had five years ago. Wow. Wild. So within your ecosystem, what's your website? Liveo2.com, L-I-V-E letter O digit 2.com. Liveo2.com. Uh, I was poking around a bit in there and also looking at some of the literature that you had at your table. And uh, it looks like you have a number of different, very targeted protocol for different things, right? Cold and flu, immunity kind of stuff. Uh, you mentioned the pelvic floor, sexual function. Are those kind of in the ecosystem within your customer base where if somebody owns the technology, they can go in and go, oh, I want to work on this or work on that. And you've developed specific protocol for those uh those goals is Correct. that kind of how you do it yeah so like most of what you know livo2 is not a medical product it's not intended for anything except for training but what happens is people will end up with the product and they call us and say okay hey how would i send more blood to this part of the body and so what we've ended up doing is architecting different strategies that will well it's, the recipe is pretty simple you use whatever you can to maximize blood flow to an organ or, you know, a tissue. And then um, you switch over and you send oxygen to it. So like if you're targeting the skin, you use a substance like niacin, it's a vasodilator that will basically cover, well, it'll dilate a number of tissues. So if you're targeting oxygen to those tissues, shot a niacin before. Okay, if you're targeting the stomach, same thing, niacin, different timing. But if you hit the stomach with a little uh, cayenne pepper, you'll stress the stomach and cause the body to send more blood to the stomach. So if you time that consistent with your workout, you can activate or you know target the stomach. And so there's different recipes for different tissues. So what we do is like you know somebody buys a product and you know you get it home. They bought it because they wanted to solve two or three problems. Then their neighbor comes over and says, "Well, they got a different product." problem so what we try to do is design our usage scenarios or protocols or programs so that you know the product itself you know works like a swiss army knife problem solution problem solution uh, the philosophy is the same but you know we'll usually go out and integrate with other products so like you know if there's a particular 
something that goes wrong, like with sexual function, will augment that with whatever chemicals, you know, are known to be helpful with, like, for example, the sexual function. You know, you've got basically vascular congestion congestion in, you know, the pelvic floor, prostate, etc. And if you can get that stuff to clean itself up, then all of a sudden things go back to the way they used to be. What are some of the other tools that you have uh, at home? Just curious, you know, I, for me, my ozone generator is is one of my mains, you know, like I would feel uncomfortable if I didn't have that because like what you're describing, it's something that I use for tons of different applications. It has so many uses. I mean, you could make ozone water and wash your dishes, you know, or clean the well, toilet. We have, or a, we have a product called Livo3 that's, oh, you know, really? attaches to the front. So oh, no I, way. I, most of my use for it is like, I'll put it in the sauna when I'm in the sauna. So I'll get dermal application of ozone. Um, I use, I, I develop, I, these are not on the market really, but I develop a trauma pad. Um, I keep a long list of supplements in the house, glutathione, etc. Yeah. What else? The other main one I have is a pulsed electromagnetic field generator. Um, that's, which one do you have? Uh, Magnapulse, which oh, okay. is a brand. I kind of abandoned that because I'm so busy marketing and developing the Libo 2. But, you know, for household trauma care, they're indispensable. So there's basically three. There's the Libo 2 with the sauna. There's uh, the Pulse Machine. Mm -hmm. There's some good ones out there. Uh, and then I developed another product we call an e-pad it's a trauma pad so that's like a travel again i haven't put them on the market because i don't have the bandwidth but you know they're they're three thousand year old technology but based on native american indian <laughs> healing stones really yeah they're wow. outrageous do you think you're ever gonna do something with that i'd love to and then uh, but anyway the yeah. so it's like in terms of what i have in my house yeah uh, if somebody wants to help me, I'd be happy to, you know, enable them. I just don't have the funding and the resources. And then I have, I'm, I'm pretty solid in Dr. Ravici's technology. So I have most of his compounds uh, available. So the big, another big one there would be um, the lipid selenium. Because oh, okay. that's, well, story. My wife just came back from the Appalachian Trail, uh, what, three, two weeks ago. Anyway, so she managed to get into some poison ivy and her... Uh, um, privates were just literally swollen shut. <laughs> oh my God. That's horrible. <laughs> okay. If you want a recipe for developing utility value with your spouse, yeah. fixing that I will can score imagine. you a gazillion points. So yeah. anyway, she came home and you know, just like, okay, first step was charcoal because you've got a ubiquinol in there and it's basically toxic. And then the second one um, was um, a substance that we're just now packaging called uh, monoammonium phosphate, monobasic ammonium phosphate, which is a Ravici, but basically it neutralizes extracellular alkalosis, which shuts down the itching. So oh, anytime no you get a viral infection, the um, itching or, you know, the a big part of the dysfunction comes from when cells can't get oxygen, they will switch over to um, use chlorine. Okay, when the cells pull chlorine out of the extracellular fluid, it orphans the sodium, and then the sodium grabs onto the hydro uh, hydroxide side of the water, so you end up with sodium hydroxide surrounding, so you end up with an acute or severe alkalosis, which causes itching. And so if you can give the body the acid it takes to neutralize that, you can, like, for example, in the case of poison ivy, wow, that's you can crazy, go for a, a discomfort of 10 to maybe one or two and five minutes wow wow so anyway i'm just back to yeah, how to score yeah. lots of brownie points with your wife <laughs> but then the, my first one would be honey that's poison ivy don't step there if I, but you weren't there so i you wasn't know, there yeah, yeah and then the next you know the next phase which is when you get into the real technology you know like for example the selenium substance which actually we do have available um that has a net effect of neutralizing the cellular toxin. So like once you get a cell that's in this distress state because it's been toxified by like in this case, poison ivy, I was able to give that to her and that actually uh, is cellular targeted. It'll go to the cells and it started to break down the ubiquinol. So she was able to recover from what an infection that would have hospitalized most people. And wow. I don't know, just over seven days. I mean, she was, she was in bed for two or three, but then, but 
anyway, in terms of winning yeah. spouse brownie points and utility value, yeah, that was it. So when you get down the list of tools, you know, those those four or five things are phenomenally valuable. Awesome, man. Thanks for sharing that. I just thought of that and I'm thinking, I wonder what he's got in his house. He must have some cool stuff, you know. I mean, if you've avoided, you know, putting your kids in a doctor's office for that long, you gotta have some good home remedies. That's I think the cool thing nowadays, like more people, you're not writing this stuff off as you know, oh, that was old granny's wisdom, like, you know, folk remedies and things like that, that I think got discredited. I, I think that if you go back a few years, you can see a lot of these things either weren't developed, like some of the things you're describing, but a lot of folk remedies are real, but because they're not patentable, especially if they're just a plant extract, well, then there was a pretty obviously con- a concerted effort to discount a lot of that stuff as just, you know, wives' tale medicine, but a lot of it really works. You know, and now many of us are rediscovering that because we're going like, man, I want to do my own thing. You know, so what is your own thing? You can find this stuff out. I want to jump on the kids deal. Okay? okay. Like we raised three kids. All right. They're rock solid. Okay. But the most important thing there is the food. Okay. How are you going to build something solid out of crap? Okay. So like with respect to raising healthy children and growing, you know, real meat, high quality food. I mean, that investment was at the grocery store. And my wife is a fabulous cook at like dinner. Like, man, (laughs) it's awesome. But that awesome food is not a luxury, especially if you're trying to grow healthy bodies. So, you know, to any parents out there, it's like, look, when you're feeding a kid, you know, realize you're building something solid and you're going to, it, it, it's going to be what you put inside the body. So, you know, <laughs> invest the money in the food that it takes to build your kids' bodies and start yeah. from the beginning. Don't skimp because that's, it's not the magic stuff in the house. You know, that stuff only gets used when they're a problem. Got but it. that actually applies to, you know, as you get older too, it's like, you know, if you eat shit, you're going to be shit. <laughs> There's the tweetable from the episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be your takeaway quote. <laughs> no, that's great, man. I appreciate that. Well, I got one more question for you today. Who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced you, your life, your work that you might share with us? Well, the first was my business partner for many years. God rest his soul. His name's John Bastian. He was a lovely human. And I had the privilege of being his business partner for about 50 years. Wow. Now, 50. Wow. 15 years, I apologize. Okay. But he was just a really... Like, so you guys got started when you were 10. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I met him when I was about, I don't know, 28, 30, something like that. And he was a partner in the software business. But the thing I always loved about working with him was he was just a really mature, nice businessman. And I didn't realize it until it took me 15, 10, 12 years to realize how wonderful it was to have somebody as a mentor that was mature, just a solid, mature male that I learned from, because I didn't know how much I learned. So that would be one. And then the other two of my heroes would be uh, Dr. Manfred von Harden, who was the guy that, you know, did the original pilot research on uh, the oxygen stuff. Brilliant guy. And uh, then the third would be Dr. Emanuel Ravici. He was, uh, he was the guy that did all this fabulous chemistry so to the extent my wife loves me uh it was his science that made me do that and i look at how these people were abused and you know not appreciated in their time so to the extent they're out there god bless them all for being wonderful humans and contributing stuff that i could take and build on into the i hope they're looking over my shoulder and guiding me to be good and help help others carry forward their work yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. I have a sense that you're going to be one of those people for some other people someday too. Yeah. Thanks for doing the work that you do. So we already gave the uh, liveo2.com site out. So we've got that. What about anything uh, social media wise you want to share with people that want to follow you? Uh, Live02 is good. It's all on there? Yep. Okay, cool. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. Great to get to know you. I, I knew today when we met, as I said earlier, I was like, this guy, is, he's a deep well. We're going to have a cool conversation, and it certainly was. So thanks for taking the time to share with us. Thank you. 
Well, there you go, folks. Another episode of the Life Stylist Podcast. My name's Luke Story. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. Listen, if you're a new listener, I want to welcome you to the show and let you know that this year, 2022, is going to be chock full of a variety of of guests and episodes. Uh, I've got some incredible things lined up and I'm super excited to share those with the new friends here on the uh, Lifestylist podcast. For those of you longtime listeners, man, thanks for sticking with us here. I trust that you're driving benefit from these conversations and uh, I want you to know that you are much appreciated. We're moving into a new year with great uncertainty. And uh, to be frank, I, I don't know what else to do except just keep my head down and keep delivering these conversations to you. I'm doing everything I can to uh, find the most useful and uplifting information that I can. And uh, you've got my commitment to keep doing so. For those of you that want to check out Mark Squibb's company, Live02, Here's how you can find it. It's lukestory.com slash live02, and that's the letter O, not a zero. Uh, I'm fascinated with this technology, and as of yet, I've still not been able to try it. Unfortunately, when he and I did this um, interview down at the, I don't even know what they call it anymore, the biohacking conference in Florida, uh, I was walking by his booth multiple times, and I just couldn't find the time to go do it. But after this conversation, of course, I was like, God damn it, I need to get one of these in my garage. So I'm going to work on that myself. Um, and those of you that think you might want to check it out, uh, there are other ways, I think, um, than buying one yourself to do this. From what I understand, they are available in uh, multiple cities around the world. And I don't know, maybe I got to find one here in Austin. But uh, I'm a huge fan of hyperbaric, as we discussed in this uh, conversation. But this seems like it takes hyperbaric to uh, another level. So my dream is to have one of these uh, Live O2 rigs in my home gym that I'm currently working on building and use the Carol bike, which is this crazy AI bike. I did an episode on that some time ago and be huffing on this oxygen and then get deprived of oxygen and just uh, see what happens. It sounds pretty incredible. And based on some of the stories that Mark not only told me during this conversation, but outside of the recording, um, it's pretty wild stuff. It's very, very impressive to say the least. Okay, in other exciting 2022 news, some of you may be aware that I finally launched my blue blocking eyewear brand. It's called Gilded. And you can find that at gildedbylukestory.com. That's G-I-L-D-E-D. -E uh, after working 17 years in the fashion industry in Hollywood and spending a couple decades learning all about biohacking, I have discovered that uh, blue light mitigation and an overall light awareness is really one of the most important things we can do for our health. And that's why I combined my experience in both of those areas and made what I hope you would agree, are some really cool blue blocking glasses that uh, are scientifically legit and valid and block the correct spectrum of light, but also uh, look fashionable enough to wear in your day-to-day -day life. Again, you can find those at gildedbylukestory.com. And the good news there is we are rolling out new frames all the time. Uh, I think we've got some kids' frames coming up, and uh, perhaps more importantly, we also have prescription glasses and readers available. I've been wearing uh, some custom uh, blue blocking prescription glasses now for a couple of years that my friend Matt Maruka from Raw Optics uh, had made for me. And so, uh, you know, that was one of my first orders of business when I launched this brand was to make sure that we had prescription glasses available as well. So um, I recommend you getting over to the Gilded site and grabbing a pair so you can uh, kick off this new year with less blue light in your life. I'd also like to invite you to tune in this Sunday for a bonus rebroadcast episode uh, with my friend Aaron Alexander with me as a guest on his podcast, The Align Podcast, and we talk about EMF exposure and how it's altering your health. So if you're someone interested in EMF, we did a serious deep dive and also talked about tons of other crazy shit. So crazy, in fact, that I almost called him and said, can you please edit out <laughs> this one section? And you'll, you'll know the section I'm talking about if you listen on Sunday. So that's just a bonus episode. And then next Tuesday, we'll be back with one of my all-time favorite humans and I think third-time guest, Dr. Ted Achikoso, 
That one's called The Cosmic MD on the Future of Consciousness and Psycho-Spiritual Evolution. Dr. Ted is a brilliant and very awake human. And just, uh, as I said, just one of those people that I am very excited to sit in the same room with. First one we did in person, then we did one on, actually, this will be his third time. We did one in person, then we did one on Zoom, and both of them were awesome, but it was really incredible to sit down uh, across from Ted. I think we went like two plus hours, and if you're someone that's interested in nootropics, uh, plant medicine, psychedelics, um, spiritual growth, the nature of the ego, consciousness, and things like that, next Tuesday show is going to be a wallop upside yo metaphysical head. To make sure you don't miss that episode or any episode to follow, please do yourself and uh, me, frankly, a favor and subscribe to the Lifestylist podcast. On most podcast apps, there will be a button you can find there that says subscribe. And when you do that, it's awesome because then every week, every episode that I publish gets automatically and magically downloaded to your device or computer, wherever you listen to your podcast. So thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you for listening. God bless and welcome to 2022.